Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 221. That's 221. How you guys doing? How you feeling? Mofuckos? Right? Let's not get any swear words in there. Let's make sure this video doesn't get demonetized. Hope you guys are doing well. Rested, hydrated with that malarkey. I'm your host, Agostino. This is my podcast, The Agostino Zynga Show. And I'm happy, happy to finally be back here in the hot seat for my regular scheduled programming. As you've noticed in the past uploads, my uploads have been a bit janky. They've been a bit short. That last episode was absolute trash. Um, I don't rewatch a lot of stuff, but I rewatched that and I was like, oh my God, I'm whispering for the whole thing. Man, sound like I'm in the Yin Yang Twins or some shit, right? Or I've got that fucking verse from 21 Savage in my head, right? Hello, guys. This is, I mean, podcast ASMR does not work. I'm pretty sure there's a genre out there that people are smashing it with, but for me personally, I don't want to hear anyone speak for more than 10 minutes whispering into a microphone. How are you, do? I hope you'll be all right, everyone out there. Long. Dead that, dead that, dead that. But anyway, I'm back now. Feeling good, feeling hungry, ready to roll. Um, a lot of things have changed in my life. A lot of things have gone from good to bad, from bad to okay to okay to reasonable. And everything is looking brighter. And now I'm going to be making the changes throughout the week in order to get back to where I was before in terms of recording and uploading these podcasts. Because, you know, this is part of this is a big part of my life and a big part. And if I'm honest, right, apart from the DJ thing, um, this has probably been the best thing that's happened to me in the last few years. Right, It's been a bit rocky. It's been a bit up and down. I've had a few... Uh, hurdles i've had to jump over and this has been the best thing in my life right this ability to like sit down here talk to fucking five people ten people hundred people two people doesn't matter how people listen to it the fact that i can sit here and just kind of get all that brain self chatter out of myself right and into a microphone uh, directly into a video record it upload it onto soundcloud itunes spotify have it on youtube right malarkey has been such a godsend it's really really helped me again i mentioned it so many times on here but I don't really have, you know, as um, charming, good looking and, you know, um, generally a good dude as I am. I don't have that many close friends, right? Um, there might be something to do with the people out there or maybe something to do with myself. But you know what? Self-reflection is boring. Let's blame everyone else, right? So, I don't have that many good friends. So, usually, well, not good friends, but, you know, I, I don't tend to, like, keep people around me that often or that long. I think it's part of my own little self-destructive nature. I like to kind of just press the fucking... Um, self destruct button if from time to time to go a bit kamikaze and shit i know i like to do that but it's what it is what can you do there are you know there, there are things in my life that i want to change and things that i'm not going to change this is this is one of them it's not going to happen um i tend to listen to a lot of american comedians especially the la based ones like you know that hang around with joe rogan and stuff and sometimes it used to really frustrate me when i'd hear them speak about their odd little quirk right it seems as if it seems as if like the adults in la are like big kids right they get to like kind of like you know um indulge in their, in their little inner child right because for the most part if you're able to make it in the entertainment business it kind of suspends all reality right you kind of are um surrounded by this halo of people around you minders assistants right whoever they may be that kind of enable your behavior because by and large you're one helping putting food on their place right or put their kids through college or provide them with a car or provide them with holidays and shit. so they're going to do everything in their power to make sure you stay the way you are whether it's wacky whether it's drugged out whether it's loud whether it's i don't know whatever it is right they're gonna they're gonna enable you for it and it used to be annoying me a lot especially someone like a burt chrysler i mean recently he made a comment like oh I think he was talking to, I think it's his recent one with, um, uh, what's their name? It's a recent one now with, with uh, Liza Kosher, Kosher, whatever. Anyway, it doesn't, Natasha Leggero and something Kosher, her husband, right? Two big comedians too. He's talking to the podcast. He's like, oh my God, like this thing I always do, I break all the toilets all the time. I always break toilets. I always break toilets. So he's like, why? Because I sit heavy. That's what I do. I always sit heavy and stuff. Like, why do you sit heavy? Like, why don't you just like sit slowly? It's like, you know, go be in the office who like in my office or I've got others I work to who do that heavy foot thing like on purpose right it's like look walk slower like I don't know like soften your feet I grew up in a house where all those little kooks and kirks that you had that you thought made you interesting they got beaten out of you right they got flipping shattered you from across the road like Agostino stop walking so heavy on the stairs okay mom I mean like you just like you just any kook you had got like ripped out of you but in general I think because of my whole self-help run that I had a few years ago I think there are things in your life that you should be ch able to change, right? In order to kind of make your life better or to make the experience of living better or to maybe, I don't know, just to uh, allow you to do the things that you want to do. So I see someone like a Burt Crash and saying, oh, I sit heavy on, I sit heavy on everything. I'm the one that just like, I let gravity. Because I think he was mentioning a story where he said that he thinks he nearly killed his child one day when they were camping because he literally missed the, the, the head of his child by an inch because he just always sits down about looking at his, his bum on the floor. 
it's like that isn't a good that isn't a core thing to have that's not like an interesting cookie trait that's just like recklessness and irresponsibility and just like not knowing the surroundings you're in you know i mean so if you're in your own house and you want to sit in your city cool but if you go to your friend's house and you're you know jumping on the set i'm gonna be a bit annoyed right that's not a way to kind of carry yourself but again i've noticed that there are things that i pick and choose that i want to change and things that i don't want to change i think probably but crash would argue the same sort of thing right and all the things he needs to change in his life maybe he's sitting he- sitting really heavily on things isn't the what number one priority same with myself right maybe my inability to not have friends isn't maybe the highest thing that i should be kind of reaching for to kind of change because maybe that's kind of what's allowed me to be um at the position i am in now to pursue the things i'm pursuing outside of it because i don't necessarily have the distractions that everyone else has right on the thursday or friday or people calling you and telling you to go out here and there like if i go out i'm just literally going out to meet one person or two people right that are in my life for the most part right um that's it and the other time we're going out i'm going out to, to go out for my own kind of pleasure right um whether it's going out to go mix garage to go to fold to go to x or y o to go to these venues i'm literally going on my own to go to pie and have a good time by myself I don't, I don't really care about anyone else that's there for the most part so that again is a cook that i have you know it is what it is you get older and you realize you know what i'll pick and choose my battles i'm gonna pick and choose them um talking about battles i don't know why we're this re- random ramble about my own self but you know this is a podcast you have to talk about oneself Let's get onto some topics that I think of interest. You know, the stuff I've got. I've got a long list of things I haven't spoken about. I'm just going to go through. Some of it's old news, so please please bear with me. I don't think podcasts matter though, that much, right? If it's old news or hot news, you're not really coming on here to hear like the current hot take on things. I, I wouldn't think so for the most part. I don't know. Maybe I'll go in different, but I think, you know, you come on podcasts to kind of hear the point of view of the person you're listening to because you think they're interesting. Hopefully, that's that's my hope. Um, so the things I've got to speak about, you know, some of it's old, some of it's new, but you know, say la vie. Um, but first off, let's go through the weekend. What I got because that's always the most important thing to go through. There's been a bit of a change. Right? I've mentioned in the past episode, but I'm I'm trying to actively, you know, there's this thing about active reading, right? Active listening, which is like this idea that you know we passively watch, read, listen to things all the time, right? Whether it's I do it all the time on Netflix these days where I just skip. I don't know about you, but I've got a habit of skipping forward on things on Netflix. I don't really, you know, I try and get out of the little mini dialogue and just go straight to the action. I do it a lot. Even movies, is really bad. Um, but that's because I'm on my phone. That's because I'm reading something else. I've got another tab open, right? I'm just doing loads of other shit. So there's this idea that you should be actively doing things, right? Actually pay your pay, uh, allowing yourself to be engrossed in whatever you're doing, paying as much attention as you can. Even if it's for a 20-minute spurt, just give all your attention to it. So, um, with that kind of active kind of participation of things, I've been thinking about this idea of like how I go out and how I enjoy nightlife. Because I said before, you know, as much as I enjoy the hedonistic sort of like party lifestyle of things, right? Whether it's drinking and all these other recreational activities I might do on the side, the actual thing that I love mostly out of going out is this idea of meeting new people, right? Connecting with new people. Like, um, I'm, I've, I'm part of the, uh, the Art Techno WhatsApp group the london meetup one i'm part of um i'm on the techno subreddit i'm on the dj subreddit um, i go on the forums i watch i check out resident advisor all the time i'm on electronic beats i'm scanning through people's i'm scanning through instagram um location feeds right people posting things from Berghain and stuff i'm involved i'm plugged in right i go out all the time i'm fucking in i'm listening to fucking dj's interviews and all that malarkey i'm what listening to fireside chats that no one else listens to probably i'm involved in stuff i'm mixing myself i'm buying records i'm downloading records i'm whatever i'm involved so i love the actual community around it right that's mostly what i like i don't the getting fucked up about it there is a good thing it's like a little cherry on the top of the cake but even if there was no alcohol in these places i'd still go for the fun and enjoyment of it but i've noticed in the last kind of few months i've been letting myself go a bit too much and going out too often to things that i probably shouldn't be going to right and not having that much of a memorable experience not that every occasion you have to go to has to be like a quote-unquote movie but you know you want to have a, a memorable experience you want to have go back and be like oh my god he or she was amazing oh that party was cool great great sound system great venue great but you, you want to come back with something to hold on to so now i've been thinking of myself of, of taking that kind of active participation thing or uh, you know into uh, into the whole clubbing going out thing i've been thinking you know what i want to make sure that i go to special events only special events things i'm really looking forward to go to and then kind of iterate that across the kind of you know schedule of my going through and one number one event that i want to really go to is um marie davidson the woman that made the track work you got to work you know that track everyone's playing now these days i'm not gonna play it because they're gonna flip and take down my video and claim copyright and all that malarkey but this lady called marie davison she's playing at um i'm going to say was it 9213 uh place whatever it's called ra i can find it there we go let me see if i can oh shit 
Hold on. Marie Davidson. All right. She's got a really, really cool um, song that I'm sure some of you guys have heard and listened to. But anyway, she's playing very soon. And I think, again, going back to my, my ethos is that nowadays going forward, I'm going to stop going to all the random nights and I'm going to invest more time into going to special occasion, which might mean me having to go to like, you know, less events week on week, but going to see the actual videos that I think are kind of pushing things forward, that are going to inspire me, that are going to make me excited to come back home and record the mix and do this. Because sometimes... I don't know about you and I don't know about other people, but I'm just being honest. Sometimes when I go to these kind of uh, nights that aren't the most special, especially being a, a kind of you know amateur DJ myself, you kind of just get more frustrated and you do get inspired, right? Sometimes because, for instance, when I went to see um, Randomer play at Mace Garage, right, for the Oranges night and Anastasia Christmas, I've got her, I pronounce her name, like fucking incredible, right? I was in awe. It made me kind of like, it really humbled me. I was like, you know what? I'm not shit compared to these guys. These guys are fucking amazing, right? It really made me appreciate just how high level, high level people can be when you go and see them. It's like, whoa, this is like another level of what anything I've ever experienced. So with that, when you go to the opposite of that, you go to a random club night, you can sometimes feel frustrated, like bloody hell, man. You know for sure that this whole industry, entertainment, scene wise from, you know, I don't, I think every scene is the same, whether it's streetwear, sneakers, you know, the metal crowd, um, skateboarding industry, fashion crew photography every season the same it's all about relationships for the most part talent can get you some way but for the most part relationships um and obviously your talent your ability to do the thing you'll say you can do will get you a long way and you know for sure when you go to these little club nights like these people playing you know it's a relationship they know who's who they're friendly with the booking manager maybe you know whatever something happened they used to work with this person back in the day so sometimes you go to these shitty nights or these like you know these kind of low level nights and let me not say shitty and it gets you really frustrated because you think, fuck, man, I could be doing such much, I could do, be doing a much better job than he or she on the decks, right? Because and you know they're only there because of the relationship, not there because of your talent. But that, again, shouldn't matter, right? Because there's many avenues for everyone to kind of enjoy and, you know, everyone's got their place in society and do things. But in general, that kind of emotion or that kind of feeling from me personally, I don't really enjoy having that kind of feeling, that kind of, because it kind of, it can fester into jealousy, it can fester into envy, and it's not a good way to go about things, right? Because everyone's journey is different. Even if I say he or she has a relationship, that's why they only use the other day. You don't know that. I don't know that. They could have fucking busted their asses for 10 years and I have no idea. They could have done unspeakable amount of things that I will never do and got to that position that they've got to, right? By merit. So there's no, you know, it's kind of presumptive, presumptive of me to think, oh, like, they're not true. They're not being real to the thing. And a lot of people that see do that, don't know, right? You get a bit butt hurt because somebody is doing something that you want to do and you get annoyed because it's, happen it's not happening to you quicker. It's kind of like a lack of patience, really, for the most part, right? You're not being patient enough, really and truly. You know, I've used this example a lot, but I know a lot of people in streetwear who have essentially, you know, and I think that's the reason why a lot of people are quite snobby and a bit off in streetwear and a bit, you know, have a little bit of a shitty attitude because deep down a lot of them know that they're only there because they just hung around long enough, right? For the most part, they just hung around. Like streetwear people, you can see, you know, London people can be, if they're honest, they can say the streetwear scene, the sneaker scene, the kind of like hip hop -y scene, whatever it may be called, I don't know what that scene is. A lot of the people that are still running things now, doing bits and doing the fucking damn thing and, you know, putting food on their plate and providing, them, and providing a lifestyle for themselves just from, like, being a person in the scene. They're only there, most of the time, they're there because they just hung around long enough. They didn't fall off. When everyone else went to go get real jobs and start families and moved away, they just hung around long enough. And, you know, if you're not, like I always say, usually energy all time about the photographer. If you're the cop photographer of a scene, and there's five of you. Because I remember at the back end of the whole Cobra Snake thing, there was about five of us in London that were like taking pictures in clubs, right? Or maybe 10 of us. I don't know. Let's say 10. There was 10, right? And five that I knew, five that I didn't know. And we were out every night taking pictures of all the big club nights in Dawson and Shoreditch and uh, Hackney, North London and South London. We were just around the scene, right? Doing the bits, right? We even went to Birmingham one time taking pictures. Like we were in there doing our thing. And the ones that are still around now making doing making the most noise are just the ones that just hung around long enough. They get invited to Paris Fashion Week, to so London Fashion Week, Milan. They're going to Petit Umo. They're going to Copenhagen. Like they're doing the damn thing because they just hung around long enough. So sometimes you can get jealous, you can get a bit annoyed, but really and truly, it's kind of like more so. You know, I talk to myself and other people. You have to kind of point the finger at yourself. But anyway, with that said, in order to take myself away from that and not to have those kind of feelings. I want to always go to high caliber events, right? Those are the ones that really kind of inspire me. And one high caliber event here that I want to show you is Marie Davidson playing at, and again, I've not been told to promote this, so don't get any feelings. I'm just showing you something that I want to go to. Um, this is Marie Davidson at a, for a night called Snack Crapper and Pop. Another really good, you know, um, London club night. They used to do them, I, I forgot what they used to do in Pacific. It might have been the, um, oh, I forgot what that place is called, man. One of the places that Alibi that closed now downstairs. 
And they see some nights there. Some anyway, but they're really well known promoters in London. They put on really great nights. Uh, Sack Capital Pop uh, co promote well promoters. I think she's on tour anyway, but they help her to put on a show with uh, Marie Davidson and Richard Fearless playing a DJ set. It's gonna it's a good one too because it starts at half seven, um, ends at half eleven. So for the people that don't actually, because you know there's a bit of a weird culture change in terms of the going out crowd. I think most of the caters I used to go out with back in the day don't really exist anymore. I bumped into a couple the other day, right? I bumped into a couple on Dawson when I was coming back from, um, what was I going to? I think I went to a club. I forgot where I went to, but um, a few weeks ago, I bumped into a couple, couple that I used to be friends, that I used to hang out with these people, right? Um, but they don't really exist anymore. Everyone's kind of on the wellness tip. Everyone's kind of like trying to, you know, get their career into check because you know, for the most part, we're all kind of around the ages between 26 and maybe 35 right this is the ages where you have to kind of get your shit into order you can't really be you know faffing around anymore so um these sort of like evening to like you know midnight events are quite popular nowadays because they still allow you to get the night train home uh 24-hour uh, buses and uber home so it's not going to cost you that much compared to like the peak peak hours so it's still quite a good time to go and of course hackney wick wallace road that whole area you know I'm about that life all the time you know create uh, brewery uh white post uh big up natalia and um <laughs> and vlad there as well doing the damn thing but yeah i'm about all these places so i'm i'm you know i'm plugged in i love it so uh, Saka proper doing a night with murray davison of course i did work um it's going to be from not in 7 30 to in half 11 um Marie, since, yeah, Marie davison life says twist and turn very delicious um haughty sing along with extended ravey runs her presence and attitude are electric see for yourself right and she's kind of an amazing woman like did, does amazing kind of live performances i'm going to show you a little video actually that i actually found um i think it was a kind of like a boiler room thing was that boiler room? i think it might be a boiler room or red ball music thing. If, I, if i could find it i'll just show you a little bit of it hoping they don't take me down for it but she's amazing she's really cool live and again and these are the shows i'm going to go to more often because i think it's better than kind of wasting your time wasting my time right going to other kind of like shittier events personally in my opinion but let's see if this works out let's see if i can find a marie davidson uh work uh, is it red Bull? i think it's red Bull. red Bull. Let me see if I can find it. She's, she's doing like a live little intro set with some people. Yeah, so this is her, right? I'm going to play it for you now so you can hopefully hear it. Let's see if I can. I've got to change the sound on here a little bit. These are all things I can see. I'm rusty. I haven't done a podcast in ages, so I've not got everything in place where it should be. But I'm going to get this in place now. Get the sound on there. Multiple output device. Hold on. Let me get that sound again. Da, 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 da. There we go. Boom. Let's get it on here. Where is she? There. Let's play it now. So if you're going to hear it, if you listen to your podcast app, this is this is a video from Red Bull Music, right? So um, I'll just pause it. It's called Marie Davidson on live performance, right? And it's just kind of going through the whole, you know, Red Bull Music Academy. I think it's been defunct now, right? I think it's been paused indefinitely. I'm not too sure what the vibe is, but uh, Red Bull Music Academy is, you know, a place where a lot of people have basically got their start or were allowed to kind of, you know, have access to some of the, you know, some of the leading figures in electronic music, get mentored, um, loads of good, cool discussions and talks, you know, that have been gone down in fucking history are available as well on there. So definitely check it out. But this is a really cool video on her talking about Studio Science. So imagine seeing this live. And again, this is what you want to see, isn't it? A little bit older. You want to see this kind of vibe. I think so. So yeah, this is what live performance is going to look like, basically. It's her basically surrounded by a ton of instruments, singing on a microphone as well. It's flipping insane. I'm going to forward a little bit here. Hope I can see it. How yeah. individual players get their own effect here. I think it's wonderful for me because it's so easy to... Um, program electron seems very complicated i'm not the kind of person who reads a manual so if you're an inst intuitive player i really recommend it what i like to do when i compose my albums i like to um, start with this one i will use a uh, percussion from this one and i always double with a 707 so i bought the same i bought the sampler to reload all my 707 drums because what I use in my music is most of the time in my dance music it's uh, percussions from the Electribe 2 combined with a 707 because I like the I like the warmth in this you know it's also interesting as well listening to people talk on rebel music it's just so interesting how much it's like i see a lot happening with um people like a brendan show who people like to hate on a lot especially if it's food truck diaries it's interesting how much comfortable how more comfortable uh an artist a creative an entertainer sports person athlete whatever they may be are 
when they're talking to somebody that's within their field, right? A peer group person, somebody that's doing the thing that they're doing, maybe at a lower level coming up. It's so interesting. Like there's such a relaxed nature about it. But the moment they go speak to a journalist, uh, you know, a, an opinion maker, whoever, whoever that person is, they kind of close up and they're a little bit more guarded and a bit more like aloof and maybe quote unquote weird. So quote unquote rude. Um, and it makes me think like I wonder why there aren't more people but I guess it's the fact that if you're a practice, for instance if I'm a practitioner which I am the last thing I want to do is be asking um, Murray Davidson questions about how to make it right I want to be actually making it myself right I don't want to be wasting time trying to figure out how to do it when you know, I, you know what I mean you kind of want to you want to do shit right you want to be in, a, in a, on the field as well so I guess that's why you don't get a lot of practitioners now becoming maybe interviewees or heading up their own online publications or video series but you always get a feeling whenever like you know, look how relaxed she is come talking to people talking to a whole class of quote unquote students who want to learn from her want to also aspire to be on her level or surpass it or do something within that kind of music field like she feels comfortable because she wants to enable them and help them get as far as they can get to because she knows how hard the grind has been right like she can appreciate um, their position that they're in because she's been there too but the moment it's a journalist the moment it's someone from resident advisor critiquing the hi-hat you did or the chorus whatever suddenly it goes and you close down in it um let me find a bit where she's singing a little bit and then I'll, I'll and then we'll kind of move on it's a really cool bit where she starts like singing basically a little bit on the thing where is it uh is it here maybe it's here click two try boom and it's nice to uh, oh. where is it yes uh and I think the Asian dude is a really big producer too, right? In the back, I think so. Let's see. Here. here she is. Watch. This is where I'm going to see her live. So definitely come if you're around. Wallace Road, Snack Up from Pop for Marie Davidson, which is this one there. Friday 9th of, of August, this Friday at Studio 9294. Here it is. Let's see. So I can find it. Here go. Yeah. You hear? She's amazing, eh? Watch. Amazing. Anyway, that you get a point of it. <laughs> wow. Okay, there we go. You get a point. Um, again, Wallace Road, 9th of August. Um, it's the seven thirty to half eleven. You're gonna see me at the front, skanking, hands in the air, going absolutely nuts to see Marie Davidson live. <laughs> um, what else happened? I want to talk about here with you guys. Uh, 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 uh. oh. So, um, over the weekend, I DJed. I'm going to DJ a lot this weekend. Um, uh, this couple of next weeks, I'm DJing. I DJed last for Friday at the Leighton Star, which is around the corner from where I live. I'm going to DJ this Saturday again at Heathcote Star, and then next Friday at the Star Bethnal. So, all the kind of fucking stars I'm playing at, which is going to be sick. And then, um, secondly, yeah, so, so, so anyway, so the last, last uh, Saturday set, banging, had a good time. Uh, I played, I did this little flyer for it which I'm very happy with. I'm going to show it off here because, you know, why not? You spend like, a couple of times on Photoshop making things, why not show it off? Uh, this is the night I put on, La Bétise with Handsome Black Man at the Leighton Star. This is me there, La Bétise here. I took the inspiration from a brand new documentary that's available now on Netflix about the SARS. The last SARS, actually, it's really good. I recommend you check it out. Um, yeah, great time. I had a great time. 9 p.m. to 1. Um, I was able, again, I, I always kind of, re I really like the opportunity to kind of play in places with actual proper CDJs and the proper sound system. Even though the sound system was a bit dodgy and late in style, but all in all, not too bad. Um, I just like the, you know, the ability to take some music from a playlist, put it on the USB and then kind of whack it through. Um, it's a bit difficult to judge because, you know, again, because I'm so used to playing so early in the day, like at seven, to kind of push it up to nine, you have to kind of decide whether you want to start really slow or you want to kind of go in hard and then kind of bring it down, right? Because you have to be aware that there's usually beer gardens in these places where people are always hanging out, especially with the weather being so nice. And they usually close around half 10, maybe 11, depending on where they are. So you're hoping that whatever you play, they can hear bleeding through to the garden and that when they come back in, you're still playing good stuff. So they want to sit down and have another couple of drinks, right? You don't want to get in a position where they're just all kind of like steamrolling out of the place because they don't like what you play at all. 
So I tried to keep it kind of loose. Uh, I tried to keep it a bit fun and whatever. And then I tried to also express a bit of my personality so people can know what I'm about. So I'm not just like some, you know, some flipping uh, DJ jukebox tour guy. So I try and kind of play my own stuff. But again, it's interesting. Good time to do. I really enjoyed it. I loved it. I had a great time. And then next Saturday, again, I'm back again at the Heathcote Star playing. So I really recommend if you're in the area and you want to see what I do in a one or two, recommend you check that out. I'll get that up on the screen as well because why not? Again, I made a fucking flyer. I'm going to put it out there. So it's another night again I'm doing at the Heathcote Star. Um, again, similar sort of vibe in terms of the flyer wise, you know, last stars and stuff. Now I go to Labatees with myself, handsome black man, we're doing the damn thing. Oh, you know what I did? So um, that's next Saturday, 10th of August. You know what I did? This time round, I wore like a really nice shirt, black shoes, and my new uh, loafers. I've been absolutely banging the hell out of my WB and uh, bass, or WJ bass, whatever they're called. How you pronounce these shoes? Um, I've been absolutely smashing these loafers out, like wearing them every single day. My Weegeons, right? My GH and GH Bass and Co, right? Uh, Stella sort of menswear loafers. I wore a really nice um, shirt with some nice black trousers and kind of did a damn thing. I think this Saturday too, I'm going to wear probably my whole suit. The suit I've worn probably about four, three times. I think I wore it for a wedding. I wore it to go to a uh, party and something else, right? So I'm going to wear it again. So, you know, I'm kind of trying to, I'm trying to really kind of absorb this handsome black man um, um, kind of like, you know, identity. At first, I was going to wear these crazy wigs and have these weird suits as my handsome black man kind of persona. But then Tyler brought out his fucking album, um, Igor, and had that weird character he's playing, right? So he kind of really kind of fessed that up. But I'm still going to go for it anyway. Why not? Just going to start buying Zara suits and stuff and just wear them when I go DJ. Um, it doesn't make any sense, right? But I think it might just kind of like help to kind of... Uh, it might help myself, right, to kind of make myself feel a bit more like an artist and take this thing a bit more seriously because I think at the moment I'm kind of... The book is starting to ramp up a bit. Um, the money isn't, right? This is a problem because I think... That's a part no one talks about too often, right? It's how do you press yourself? Because I know for sure, for a fact, I'm better than a lot of people out playing it at the moment. I'm still not top tier, don't get me wrong. I shouldn't be anywhere near an X or Y or whatever it may be, right? But I think I'm good enough to play at most of these kind of like, you know, barry clubby venues maybe the quote-unquote nightclub nightclub scene i'm not that ready for just yet but the kind of like cool bar club venue and like your trendy east trendy stuff i can dappy that easy with my eyes closed right but at the moment you know maybe my relationships aren't really there where they need to be so again that means i have to go out more i have to start talking to people and start connecting the dots because you know just uploading random mixes up onto onto soundcloud all the time doesn't really do the job i most of my stuff even this stuff i'm doing now at the moment has come from relationships right i basically got an in with the Star Bethnal Group because of a nice manager I worked there previously who kind of brought me in and that was kind of basically how I got there. So um, everything's through relationships. I have to kind of be wary of that and kind of understand where my position is. Um, but going forward, um, I'm kind of want to want to really detach myself from it and kind of present this other image of this other dude when I'm playing. So that means, you know, whether it's the nice shirts or the suits, I want to be a little bit cleaner a little bit more professional right whether it's always getting a haircut when i'm djing right saving the last fucking 20 pound i have and getting a trim i want to do little things to kind of get me into the kind of artist mode i'm, I'm thinking of like old school remember mr airplane back in the day that he used to be like you know not back in the day he's still i think he's still around now at the moment right mr airplane i'm pretty sure Let's see if i can find him mr airplane's probably still around doing that thing it's like oh i guess you know how dare you say do you remember mr airplane but he was big back in the day when we were all listening to, oh, Mr. Airplane Man, is that him? Or is it, no, it's Mr. Airplane Man. That's a musical group. What group is that? A rock group from back in the day. Okay, Mr. Airplane's a DJ I'm talking about. Um, he's on RA, Mr. Airplane, DJ RA. Let's see if I can find him. Oh, it's just Airplane now. Okay, I guess it wasn't Mr. Airplane, it was just Airplane. So this guy called Airplane back in the day. He used to be in a group, forgot the name is, but they split and now he's doing it on his own. Oh no, it's called the. No, I'm thinking about the magician. That's what I'm thinking about. The magician. Remember the magician? He was a DJ back in the day. They used to be big during the kind of indie scene, indie dance scene uh, when that was really big. Uh, the magician, right? He kind of had um, that kind of persona where he used to wear like suits and shit when he was DJing. Let me see if I can find him. Yeah, there we go. See, I knew it. I knew I, I was knew I was talking about. So this is this guy, French dude. I'm assuming, right? Is he French? What is he? Uh, the magician. Shrouded in mystery. Okay, we don't know. Okay, shrouded in mystery. But anyway, this is the this is the magician from back in the day. Um, used to be a smasher, and he kind of always wears these kind of really amazing dandy fucking sort of suits. Right? I'm not sure they hide the Aikerman. I'm not sure what they are, but you know, he plays mostly kind of new disco, Afro, no, no disc, new disco, indie dance, disco sort of vibes, and he kind of wears this sort of stuff. Yeah, they used to be together, right? Airplanes and just is coming. They used to kind of be together, but then they split and kind of did their own thing. Um, and I think he's still out playing now at the moment, right? Let's check his RA. 
this is like this is like the actor version of IMDb, right? RAs, right? Seeing how active somebody is, <laughs> but he's he's absolutely so okay. He's gonna play at Southwest Four Festival in two thousand nineteen. Uh, let's see other, other events he's played at previously where's he been at um, yeah he's been at Electric Castle did a couple of times in New York uh, he's played at, yeah so he, he's been active but he's played basically every month this whole last this whole year right for the most part yeah he's been doing his damn thing but I'm playing again so it's kind of vibe I'm kind of going for right handsome black man um, loads of nice suits loads of just kind of going you know trying to equate the whole handsome thing just kind of dressing up a bit because mostly whenever I DJ'd for the most part I'd be wearing fucking raggedy clothes right not really giving not really putting any effort into kind of my outfits and my dress code and um, you can see you can see that here in my uh, DJ um, Instagram profile um, which you can find on Instagram which is DJ handsome black man all one word DJ handsome black man on Instagram um, this is me right I'll show you uh, here I am right so usually I wear this kind of like, you know, just my my standard kind of going out club wear, which is probably isn't the best thing to be wearing. Um, it's sort of like, you know, these kind of, oh, I'm thinking if I do go and make relationships, I might have to kind of keep wearing the same thing in it so people know that it's me, right? I have to kind of go a bit dressed up. But anyway, I'll be wearing stuff like that. This is like me, me playing the last set, the alibi, having a fucking hot, heavy metal long sleeve shirt on a do-rag and a beard, right? Do the damn thing, playing fucking disco. And I love that though, because, I, you know, I gave them, I gave them my fucking all just playing fucking cheesy disco wearing the stuff that i was wearing it was very very funny but anyway um that was that's basically my idea going forward i'm going to do it again check me out here don't have many followers on instagram only your, your 22 cause i don't really post much on there engage <laughs> is the best but definitely check me out uh, dj handsome black man um all one word on instagram for my uh dj profile but yeah i'm going to be a bit more dressed up kind of like you know kind of get into the persona of handsome black man um again it's more so in the, under the kind of guise of my default goon blog page which i've got i just i don't know i like kind of surprising people i like walking into a venue people expecting me to be this you know guy that's gonna play bass or dubstep or like i don't know um you know oh this camera is not really straight it's a um they, they expect you to play one thing and then you get in there and you kind of understand the crowd like i the best compliment i got was playing at a house party once quite recently um for this guy that's a friend of a friend um very popular in the gay scene and i kind of walked in and they, and they just thought oh no right they're gonna this guy's not gonna get it he's gonna be a bit cre-. you know i don't know they just you know people have their prejudices and their stereotypes and they think of people like this yeah, so it's all right because they don't know me so i got in there and i you know and i just fucking ripped it to pieces right i knew exactly what to play i knew what they like and I just tore it apart. And at the end, they were like, oh my God, man, we we're so surprised. We thought you were going to play this one thing. You pick a bit different. It was very gay friendly. Da, da, da. And I'm not gay, right? And I can, and I knew what they wanted, right? And I just gave it to them. Gave it bang, 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 bang. No pun intended, right? And they were so happy about it. And I was like, yeah, this is what I live for. I live for this moment. Like, I know some people would annoy them, like, oh, how dare you? You don't know this. Like, we invented disco. Black people are doing it. It's whatever, right? I don't care. I like surprising people. I like giving them a surprise because you think, I don't know. Looking at me, you might think I'm going to play you a flipping um, living proof set, right? From beginning to end, but I'm not, right? I'll lead that, I'll lead it for the others because they can do that much better. I'm going to stick to my lane, which is kind of being this eclectic dude, bringing all these different references. And hopefully, I work. But yeah, that's enough about me blowing my own art, blowing smoke up my own ass. Let's get into some topics. So on the interwebs, on the interwebs. So um, let's get into something. What do we want to talk about here? Number one, the future of club culture. So this is a great video. I spoke about a little bit in the last podcast with Resident Advisor. Resident Advisor, Resident Advisor, my favorite place to go to. Some of the writing is a bit annoying. The fact that they close the comments is super stupid because, you know, some DJs were getting their feelings but hurt because fans like ourselves, you know, there's a group of, there's going to be fans out there that are just nice supportive people that are going to come and support your show there's going to be some fans out there that are dickheads too it's a to and fro of it right that's what made Resident Advisor popular that's what made it the place to go to because they had this great community there obviously over the years the community or the online commentating space has kind of changed and shifted over the years so maybe they kind of felt a bit uncomfortable where it turned into but there are ways to go around kind of managing it for some way shape or form to completely close the comments is asinine because it doesn't stop people hyping up the DJs that they want to hype up it doesn't stop people um, I heard someone on Boy Room say recently, uh, business techno doesn't stop business techno becoming bigger and people that have no right or talent to be on a particular stage do get promoted. It doesn't stop janky promoters. If anything, it enables them. Because you remember back in the day, actually, right? RA Comments used to always get into promoters who were putting on a, doing a shit job, right? How, doing shit sound, not hiring enough security, not having, I don't know, water stations, whatever it may be, right? The, the comments were always straight into that, how badly organized uh, festivals were. And I'd like to think, actually, Crank Brother was probably a good example of it. Even though they probably won't agree, I think Crank Brother used to get a lot of stick on the RA comments for their events, for their sound, all that sort of stuff, right? 
And over time, they started to hone it and get better at it, right? And they started to really kind of get, I think even London Warehouse, um, what's it called? London Warehouse Events, whatever. They used to be the ones as well. They used to get quite a lot of stickers. They used to be the ones that put in all the good nights, like Toy Toy as well. And um, part of the reason why they they got to where they got to, again, they won't admit it possibly, but the kind of amount of stick they used to get online used to really push them to kind of put on a better show because people were demanding refunds, well, that sort of stuff. That's going to come out of pocket and hurt. So a lot of the things that Aria are doing nowadays is a bit annoying. But again, I'm something that's taken more. I like to kind of concentrate on the things that I get out of it. Again, it's still the best place to get events listings. They still have some of the best reviews on there. Some of the event reviews are fucking amazing. They're written by people that actually love or are passionate about going out. And if you if you listen, watch, read any reviews on Pitchfork, which I rarely do, but if you do come across it, you will realize there are writers on there who have a very cynical point of view about things, right? They're quick to kind of rip into independent or up-and-coming artists and kind of tear them apart on their first album, which, you know, is fucking weird. But you get the feeling they don't really enjoy what the music industry has become, which is interesting. You know, there's a debate around that. But if you're going to review nowadays music, you just need to come into it and just accept it for what it is, right? And review the stuff that you like or you don't like. But offer some kind of opinion, but don't come into it like hating everything, right? But already you get the feeling people actually enjoy music. They actually give, even the negative reviews, they give quite constructive kind of pointers and stuff. In general, I like the site. And part of the reason why I like it as well is the RA version of, is a version of Exchange, the kind of podcast they have where they sit down with people in the industry and they kind of shoot the shit. And they did like a, sort of like a, a live one um, um, at um, IMS, which is Ibiza, kind of like, you know, an uh, electronic kind of music conference thing that they do when Ibiza season popping off. You know, a lot of people in the industry kind of sit down and talk and shoot, shoot the shit, which is quite interesting. Um, they got really cool interview recently that I listened to with Loco Dice. No, Loco Dice, sorry. Um, is it Loco Dice? What's on Loco Dice? Luciano. Luciano's Lucy on Serba, which, you know, a lot of people didn't, weren't aware of. And he's kind of, you know, spoke very well about sobriety, about, you know, the perils of um, hedonistic lifestyle in electronic music scene. Just a really solid interview. And you only get it from Rose and Bison because people really respect their name and are willing to kind of sit down with them and kind of shoot the shit. So they did this amazing podcast recently, right, with a bunch of industry insider where they talk about the future of club culture and where it's kind of heading. Um, it's all really interesting. I didn't really put any time because of things that I like to listen to. So I would I wish I should have done that going forward. But we'll play a little bit of it and then we'll kind of speak about some of the things I spoke about. And then there's a comment on here that I thought was really interesting that we also can speak about too. Um, this is kind of Will Lynch kind of it's interesting the segment. Let's see. Just, just echoing what Keith said earlier and what Andrew said there. Oh, okay. Let's go to the first bit. I think the first comment kind of from this. So basically, they've got loads of industry people sitting down and talking about. The comments, you know, about the future of club culture where it's heading. And I think this first comment kind of encapsulates most of the debate. Well, I'm Andy Booker of Fabric, so... <laughs> um, yeah, but one of the things that I'm really worried about is that the, the, the ecosystem of club manager, venue, promoter is, is broken in the sense that the people are taking 100% of the risk at the bottom of the food chain and there's less money coming in but year on year, our artists want more and more money. And this is where it becomes impossible to book. Lineups I used to book four or five years ago cost me 25% more than they do now. So actually, the level of lineups I can present for the money is less value to the customer. But the artists want more money. Ticket prices are at a maximum for our club. We feel the drinks prices are at a maximum. We feel there's nowhere to go. So... It, what's the answer to that? I don't really know. I feel there needs to be a big reset in fees and ticket prices to get people back into, well, especially in London, to get people back into the clubs because footfall is going down and the ticket prices, when I started going out, were £10, £15. They're now £25 from most clubs. And if you talk to our friends near next door, you, see, you know, it's even more for, for print works, but it's a, it's a lot larger scale. How do we get there? I don't know, but that's one of the issues that really, really concerns me is is the level of lineups we can put on or can't put on anymore. So that's an interesting point, right? I think that kind of encapsulates the whole issue that they have going on. This is kind of like from a booker from Fabric, so it's a bit hard to, you know, maybe in terms of the whole general clubbing culture, it's hard to kind of maybe apply that kind of wisdom to every situation because uh, you know fabric is at the apex of the hill right they're kind of one of the top clubs they've gone through what they've gone through with the local council with the police with drug abuse with people dying um, on their premises due to kind of things so they've, they've got a bit of a murky background a bit hard to quantify but again they're at the apex they're the top dogs in the scene um i think what he's speaking about the issue um here is that 
from my opinion, again, got from being someone that goes out a lot, and I'm I, and I and I, you know, as Americans say, party, right? I party, I go out, I'm I'm out and about, I'm plugged in, I'm involved in the scene. I'm not kind of like a passive um, spectator. I'm actively involved in the things that are going on. I DJ, you know, I, amateurly on the side. I promote nights myself. Um, I design flyers. I'm on for, I, you know, I'm I'm the kind of kid that would wanna pay 25 quid to go see Ricardo Bell Lobos at Fabric, right? I will do that and also pay 10 pounds to go see a nobody at the Yard Theatre, right? Like, this is what I'm about. And I think the main issue for me, having come from the kind of heady days of the whole East London scene, is that basically, effectively, in my opinion, I think the local boroughs or local councils have effectively killed nightlife due to the kind of draconian licensing laws that they have in place at the moment. I think the moment clubs started to close earlier, and the moment, um, you know, um, late licenses were being denied left, right, and centers, and people couldn't put late license applications in. I think maybe in the beginning it might have been, let's say it was more than 10, now it's less than six, right? Applications you're putting through throughout the year, and they get denied all, all, all over the place, left, right, and center. The moment it got harder and harder and harder to just go to a regular nightclub and just have a good time, the moment we ran out of kind of plastic people type venues, right? 200 to 500 people, um, small venues that you could just kind of like book your kind of, you know, imagine, for instance, again, this is no shade to anyone. I don't know if she's got better or not got better. It's not that she's a bigger platform now at the moment, but I saw Claire Fifi play at Fold, right? And she is the last person to play at the night. I think it might have been, I forgot who was playing. And the whole place was absolutely empty, right? She, no, everyone kind of left. Well, whenever the headliner played, Claire Fifi came out at the end and everyone kind of emptied out. Now, that's not Eclair Fifi's fault, right? She's a fucking amazing DJ. It's the fault of the venue. Maybe her booker maybe put her on. But people that's not really, you know, I don't know, whatever. But it's more so the fact that there's not enough venues. There's not enough smaller kind of like plastic people type venues that Eclair Fifi can play on. Because imagine if, if Eclair Fifi's playing back to back with, F, uh, no, FX Twins playing before and she's playing after, right? People will still hang around at, at plastic people and hear her play. But at Fold... Everyone's just going to go home, right? Because it's a big club and, you know, you just, when everyone leaves, it looks like everyone's left, but it's not everyone. It's like there's still room there. There's still people in there dancing, but it looks like everyone's gone. So I think the fact that we don't have that many smaller scale clubs in that kind of realm has really hurt club culture because I think there's people out there who aren't like me, who aren't nerds and who aren't willing to go to lengths that I go to, whether it's kind of following this in, this Facebook page that uploads... Pro, like, for instance, I bumped into this girl the other day at the, a white post who puts on these um kind of party in the park festivals well part well raves in the park sort of kind of parties right similar to the keep on going sort of crew like there's a whole bunch of these italian french spanish dudes girls coming into london who are just fucking killing it on the promoting side right they kind of put all these really crazy random events in weird places uh and they're all kind of all kind of like hush hush word of mouth sort of stuff right so you got invited to a facebook page you got invited to this thing you got a texas number really cool and i bumped into the club and i got to know and then she sent me the thing amazing um, but that's because I'm a nerd and I go out all the time. If you're a regular consumer, you just want to go to a club and have a good time, there's not that many options to go to, right? There's XOYO, there's P Printworks, there's all these kind of places, but they all require tickets. They're all kind of £25 and plus. They're not very spur at the moment. Venues, um, passive people in these kind of places are good because you could generally get into them for about £15, um, maybe less, right? Uh, Bar Bar is maybe a good example of that too. There's kind of like, you know, mid sized venues. Alaba is a good example of that too. Um, but the moment the licensing laws came into place, they effectively killed all those smaller venues because they can't make any money during the day because no one's going to the alibi at 7 p.m., right? They're, you're going to go there between the hours of 12 and 4 or 12 and 6, right? Those are times you're going to go there. So they're struggling a lot. And the only place I think that isn't struggling really for the most part, and it's mostly because of the proximity, I just thought about it now, is Mix and The Yard, right? In Hackney Wick that I love to go to. And if you see them, they're both right next door to um, How the Howlin' Taps place and um, the Crate Brewery, right? And people stay there. People are out at the Crate on Thursday to Friday from like 4 p.m. onwards, right? It's fucking ram jammer. People love the Crate. They love hanging out around there. So there's a group of people that like to go hang out around the crate who just kind of run the buy mix and see it open and be like you know fuck it let's just go have a good time here's some techno just go in right especially because it's priced around 10 20 pounds easy to go or the yard whatever simple but clubs that don't have that kind of a, that, that are a bit like maybe you know and we're in the worst place of town don't have that kind of advantage of having just good parts of traffic so i think it goes what you're saying is true the footfall is closing but mostly because of licensing laws it doesn't really have to do with the bookings and stuff or the djs asking for more money i don't think you can reverse back the clock i think now if anything with the advent of social media with the fact that there's a lot of female djs in the scene now a lot of younger djs in the scene now if anything like like myself right that's how i got into djing by seeing somebody else like look like me or somebody that i thought was my kind of vibe playing behind the decks 
it's only going to get more people involved and the more people that are involved the more sponsors i want to get involved i think the foot flow thing or the dj money thing might have to correspond directly with the amount of people now that are more fans of djs right they have groupies of of djs there are people that have the there's djs that have fan pages that are no not tied to them at all right big up to arm to dixon one of my favorites out there but djing is big now right djs are big are pop stars in their own kind of right right you look at people like a dj snake and shit right like he sells out venues like that right these are big business regardless if you're independent regardless if you're underground or commercial so i think that these djs now command an audience they command big fees right um artists are willing, uh, players are willing to pay them because you're going to get out the door you're going to get a crazy bar spend it goes hand in hand so you can't really reverse that i think the problem again as i'm saying is that if you're on a claire fifi where can you go? Like, even Jasper James, those kind of dudes, right? He played an amazing kind of... He had a really good residency, which they sorted out for him in Phonics, or like, I think it was a while, wherever it was. That was a great idea, right? Even, like, a DJ High. Let's say DJ High is a good example, right? From, um, originally from Ridley Road Market Bar. She kind of, you know, the, it, it, her origin story is that she kind of was dapping a dance over there. Some amazing booker happened to be passing by while she was playing and kind of signed her on, and then she kind of, you know, went completely... Um, over the top, over the hill, and smashing it now, and touring all over the world. Played with God the other day, like just an absolute killer DJ. Um, there's a lot of DJ highs in London. There's a lot of girls, guys in the UK playing week in week out in random bars and pubs, random bars and bars and pubs that you have no idea about who are smashing it, who don't have the ability to go to that next step because the next step again for myself, like I'm I'm playing at quite cool venues in London, right? Um, trendy little bars and clubs and places right around the around the scene. But my next step should be like a mix in the yard, right? But there's only two of them that I know of, right? There's not many others. Um, there might be the, what's the Night Tales place in Hackney, but it's not. It, there's not many of that level. Um, the next level above that is straight above to flipping. I don't know, print works all that sort of malarkey, right? Which is too much of a gap fold. You need to be able to have that other venue just above the kind of bars and clubs that allow you to kind of play. But those places don't open late enough, right? And then people don't want to go, the general partners aren't willing to go to. So I think the moment they change the licensing laws, the moment licensing laws are a bit more relaxed and we can have more venues open until four, right? Make sure we open until four all the time. Four or five every single night because that's 3, 3 a.m. most nights, right? It should be open until 4 a.m. every single Friday and Saturday. Every single Friday and Saturday because that will then allow the promoters at Mixed Garage at the yard to put more DJs on that are like of that level just above, right? Like, so the Claire 50s, the, 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 the Jasper James. I'm using them example because the only ones are popping my head sometimes because then that will allow you to cultivate the next DJ high. They will come out of that kind of spectrum as opposed to like, you know, booking the kind of quote unquote big name DJs who are also always going to sell, but then they should also be reserved for the big events. Like, you know, when you go see Dixon playing at Junction 2, right? That's special because this is Dixon at Junction 2. It, it, it's a festival. It invites a fucking everyone, right? Doesn't matter, Color Creed or whatever. But that clubbing experience, that kind of training rules you're going to get from kind of being able to kind of cultivate a crowd from people that know you, that don't know you. It's sort of similar to comedy clubs, right? There's an open mic scene, there are the established clubs, and then there's also kind of, you know, selling out the, you know, Madison Square Garden. There needs to be that middle ground. There needs to be three steps. It can't just go from like one to one to three. And I think that's what you see sometimes going on in the scene nowadays. And again, the three things I don't think is that big of a deal because I think you know, if you put on a good night and then maybe they smashes it, you're gonna smash it regardless. But yeah, so again, this is a good debate. I recommend you check it out. That's the one point I'm gonna speak about. The rest of it, I think, it's best you just kind of check out for yourself. But it's a really amazing podcast. A really amazing episode. It's episode number four six six. Um. Um, from Resident Advisor is called Where Is Club Culture Headed To? A really amazing series. I rec recommend you check it. Again, Resident Advisor has got a lot of stick over the years, but in general, I still think it's one of my go-to places for all electronic music news. I kind of go there and then go to other places. I found other websites, such as Electronic Beats through Resident Advisor. Do you know what I mean? They allow me to kind of plug into stuff. So we recommend you check it out. Really cool series there and loads of really good, interesting points that I'm sure you guys will dig. Um, next on the list here. Uh, but, but oh, we actually had uh, no, no. Let me just go back on here. Um, so uh, a BuzzFeed guy trains to he, he tries to fight. He tries to <laughs> you know BuzzFeed have these articles or these videos they do where someone tries to do something in a short space of time. Then this mad one where a, a BuzzFeed editor, like somebody that's not very aggressive or is not very physically or athletically gifted, <laughs> decided to do three months training to fight a real MMA fight. That title alone got me. The thumbnail got me. I clicked it straight away. And what I was what I was kind of show number one i love the guy in the video right he fucking smashed it credit to the dude like that takes the biggest amount of balls you can't i can't emphasize enough how difficult or how much courage it takes to sign up to go to a martial arts or a combat sports class let alone to sign up to fight somebody professionally it takes so much balls 
that you won't know how long it took me to sign up for five Groupon classes to do Thai, um, to do um, kickboxing. It took me ages, maybe a couple of months, to finally get the courage to do kickboxing. And I and I don't think myself as a wimp or as a pussy or as a wallflower. You know, I think of myself as somebody quite. <laughs> I can stand up for some and stuff, but it took me two months to pluck up the courage, right, to grow a pair of big boy balls, to pull up my trousers, and decide to go to do a five day, uh, five classes of fucking taekwondo. I mean, a uh, uh, kickboxing, right, in a in a fitness first somewhere near Liverpool Street, right? Not even a, in a proper like you know martial arts gym where it's like covered in um you know martial arts posters and there's always aggressive dudes that's like no just in the standard fitness first in a little studio it took me five two months to do it two months not five months two maybe five who knows but anyway it took me a while to get so for this dude that's sitting in a desk shop somewhere writing buzzfeed articles to decide to do a combat sport this is amazing but also goes to show just how careful you have to be about how you speak about your dreams who you surround yourself with because for the most part this world is full of so many naysayers, so many people don't know jack shit, who just speak from no experience. And there's a thing now there, probably because of social media, because you know that social media basically allows everyone to have a voice. So I think that maybe is the reason why it's prop- it's um it's propagated or put up on a pedestal. This idea of people having very strong opinions with very little experience, what they're talking about, right? It's I've, I heard someone say the the phrase uh, "wrong and strong," right? Um, but there's this idea that people just want to speak about things and just be, you know, ah, he can't do this, she can't do that, ah, ah, and you have no experience, have nothing to gauge it on, right? What do you have to gauge it on, though? Like, you have no practitioner experience yourself, you don't know anything, just like splurting out something for the sake of it. Um, and effectively, this guy decides to train three months of MMA against a ridiculous um, notion, it's not going to work out for him, it's a crazy idea, but he decides to do it just for your own self. Sometimes you want to do stuff just so you can prove to yourself that you can do it. It doesn't matter if you get knocked out or you get put to sleep like this dude at the end of it. The fact that you did it just tells you, wow, I can. I did this thing in three months. I lost this man away. Look how strong I got. Like, for instance, he got knocked out in this fight, right? He got put to sleep by this guy in a guillotine choke. But by and large, right, he's probably, he can probably still fuck up most people. That's the thing, right? It's not about, martial arts isn't about that thing, about starting fights and stuff. It's about self-defense. But the fact of the matter is, his three months of training allows him to still be more confident than probably 60% of the kind of population out there. And most of the time, when you get into street fights or people get into some sort of physical altercation, all that kind of posture, ah, oh, shouting comes out of it. But really and truly, if you know what you're doing, you're more likely to avoid the situations anyway and kind of like duck out because you don't want it to go, you don't want it to go left and you don't know what that guy has in his pocket or his bag or whatever. But for the most part, if you know how to handle yourself, that calmness, it exudes, people can see it and they can tell Shayer from the first punch. You only have to watch a couple of World Star Hip Hop videos to see that if one person doesn't have to fight, the other person realizes it straight away after one hit because that hit is precise. It's not like a, a half a fist on top of head or like a scuffed shoulder. It's a proper fist inside of her face. They're like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. They've realized straight away. So this guy has still done the damn job. But look at how disparaging, look at how negative his fucking colleagues are. People that he thinks that are, and again we were working in workplaces where we think people are your friends but they're not really you know you just work with them but look how disparaging they speak about this guy right that's trying again just a standard dude from the office trying to make some content for his company helping out them get clicks and views probably gonna you know buzzfeed had to lay off tons of people recently right this video could potentially help them get more sponsors it could potentially help the company stay alive right loads of things are into this thing but look how disparagingly his his friends or his colleagues talk about him with his challenge dude right let's see and the top, he's a super, super chill dude as well for the most part. But here, look at his, look at his, uh, his colleagues talk about him. I'll get a video up on here now. This is BuzzFeed article, right? And we're going to see in that moment whether he still wants to do this or not. So the, 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 the videographer saying if you listen to her podcast, he's asking his colleagues who have been interviewed prior about, you know, giving some background colour on who this guy is. They're asking, oh, do you think Arya has it in him, right? To legitimately fight someone. Why or why not? Here's what they say. <laughs> laughing. I love you, Arya, but no. <laughs> Look at this guy with his fucking backwards hat and his stupid moustache laughing at somebody else, fi- like deciding, right, to put up the courage to go and fight. And he's laughing. Do you, do you think he could ever... That's the thing sometimes you feel sometimes like... um. I think brand is a lot, right? You what some things you can't fake. Fighting, being good at sex and being funny, right? Like they, you just can't fake certain things. Like there's there must come a point in time in a man's life where you realize, you know what, if this guy went to fuck me in the ass, he could. He actually could fuck me in the ass. Cause he can beat me up and just do whatever he wants to my body. That has to be a humbling experience. So for someone to take the courage to try and learn how to protect themselves and the people they love around them, 
you have to kind of hold your hands up, even if he's, you know, he's gonna get smashed. That takes guts because you know you can't do it. You know you're not gonna put down your fucking food truck taco and go and train. You won't do that, will you? <laughs> I love you. What a knob. Know. What a knob. <laughs> He's too nice. I think that he's going to lose. I know that he's going to lose. He's probably one of the softest people I know. The girls I don't care about because, you know, girls have the wrong, they, they don't really have to judge kind of physical combat. It doesn't really something that comes into them you know, um, naturally in that regard. That physical altercation is not really a thing that happens a lot with women. It's mostly kind of reputation damage and stuff. So I don't really take that too thing in again. Sometimes girls have to be spicy for sake of it. But the dudes, dudes should know, man. You know how much courage it takes to fucking learn how to fight. Like, it takes a lot of courage. That because when you get when you get punched in the face for the first time, that actual, that accusation that that happens so easily, so regularly, like I did, right? I kept getting clipped in the face by my instructor because I wasn't putting my hands up properly, right? And that idea, like, wow, this is happening all the time. So someone, if I was fighting somebody and I decided to throw hands, they could just jab me from a distance, right, repeatedly, and I wouldn't get anywhere near them, nowhere near them, right? As I'm trying to play, like nowhere, they could do what they want with my wife and children. They could take my house, steal my bike. Right, run away with my fucking clothes and my trainers. They could do what they wanted, take all my books. They could do what they wanted. So as a dude, you know, it takes up so much courage to do it. So for dudes to be disparaging about it, it's like, come on, guy. You know how you know how much courage it takes to do. <laughs> I honestly feel like he's just gonna go into the match and get hit like a couple of times and be like, okay, that's cool. That's enough for the video. Every time he throws a punch, he's gonna apologize. <laughs> this, this dude, the mustache is a donkey, isn't it? I think it might be a waste of time mostly imagine like imagine this is your friends right and they're telling you that you're pursuing your dream or pursuing something that you're interested in is a waste of time why is it a waste of time you know how everyone had a band in school or everyone tried to MC, or everyone tried to sing that isn't a waste of time you did something that you enjoyed at that period of time in your life that brought you a lot of joy it allowed you to learn a new skill. It allowed you to understand how to make a fucking um, album cover on on paint. It allowed you to make an album cover on PowerPoint or a crack version of Photoshop. It allowed you how to understand how music streaming works. Upload it onto a streaming platform to maybe monetize it. It allowed you to maybe make a really janky music video on your on your smartphone. It allowed you to maybe send it out or put it on the forums or share it on social media. Create a little profile for yourself, even if it's a secret one. Hide it, hide your identity like party next door. It allowed you to do all these little cool things on a side even if it results in zero plays no one pays attention to it that exercise alone is so gratifying right the fact that you did it because when you're older you have a story to tell you you could tell your kid hey i used to have a band i used to have a shitty mixtape i put out look at this look at this band i had back in the day look at it that makes you an interesting person everyone always talks about when ricky gervais comes on the program they always go on about that image of him i think he was in a band back in the day right that didn't do well that got signed and you know he's got a really good story about how they got signed and they spunked all the money up the wall and you know this is ricky gervais but that's a real interesting part of his story he's got his really cringy um uh, press shots that he took of the whole thing when he was enjoying himself in that kind of situation but that's a really important part of his life that kind of made added to his kind of journey right or made or helped make the person that he is nowadays that part of the story so for someone to for your friend to tell you what you're doing is a waste of time even if it is a waste of time it's crazy because it's not a waste of time because it's going to add an interesting path to your story because who wants to just wake up who wants to if they've got something in them if they've got some kind of spark some divinity some kind of idea some kind of feeling that they, should, they could be doing more with themselves right who would want to live a life of just going into work and coming home who want to do that if you know you can do a tiny thing on the side knitting playing the ukulele djing reading books annotating things talking on a youtube channel like myself with 10 listeners whatever it may be who would not want to do that that was what makes life more exciting somebody to tell you it's a waste of time is insane it's no waste of time it's a waste of time going to a bar every friday and drinking the same beverage or talking about the same shit you talk about but people still do that that's why i, I don't really i never get the idea like i always need to think to myself like there are certain things that get propped up on social, like, you know, the idea that you're going out to a festival to whatever and you're wasting your money or do whatever, you're wasting, you're having a good time. But the moment you try and do something a bit difficult, a bit out of the blue, you know, I always say the moment you decide to do, a, 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 you decide to go on a diet and you tell everyone, suddenly all these dietitians in your fucking, um, you know, follower feed start popping up and telling you that, oh, this ain't good, this ain't healthy for you. Like, shut the fuck up. Let me do it. Let me just fail in my ass and figure it out myself and go on it because you're not doing it. You're not deciding to discipline yourself and stop yourself from enjoying all these mouth pleasures every single day of the week. You're not. I am. 
for seven days or five days of the week, I'm deciding to go keto. I'm deciding to fast 60 hours a day. It doesn't matter if it's not healthy and you don't think it's a good idea to do it. Let me do it and then let's go from there. But again, this is like, this is kind of the common debate between practitioners and spectators, right? Sitting on the sidelines and actually being on the field. Even if you're on the bench, right? Even if you're on a fucking stand, it's better. It's better than standing there and criticizing. It's just an amazing point of view. And imagine these are these colleagues. It's a waste of time. We do. How is it a waste of time? He's probably the talk of the fucking office this whole time he's been doing so it's not what he's saying because they've got something to talk about apart from talking about the same old things they're talking about trump um you know um whatever else they talk about in the offices and pay and whoever they hate do you know what I mean? like he's actually making your lives more interesting by doing something interesting for himself like it wastes time mama mia anyways continue but anyway that was basically you know what yeah terry to fight underdog within you that is trying to prove something I really recommend you check it out. I'm going to mute it for now, but you know, it really goes through a lot of good things. And yeah, like I said, in the end, he, he, you know, he gets choked out by guillotine choke by, by the guy who's been fighting professionally for like a year or something. So it's not even a fair contest. But again, he did it. He did it. He fucking did it, man. He fucking did it. And I'm really proud of the dude. Um, well done for doing it and kind of, again, putting yourself out there. Because again, that's the thing that most people don't do. Most people live lives of quiet desperation, right? What, what, is that Theodore Roosevelt? What's that quote by? Is it Theodore Roosevelt? Um, most men lives quiet. Um, or is it um, my guy? Most men live lives of quiet desperation, right? This is a really... Oh, uh, Henry David Faru, yeah? Very, 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 very good quote. Let's see if I can get up on here and show you guys because this kind of really kind of summed up kind of how i feel about some people that you know are so quick to kind of point out people's misgivings and talk shit right um what was that new york time oh, I don't know. go away these dumb white people talk about it they're just doing going good reads there's good reads up there yeah. the mass of men leaves lives of quiet inspirations yet yeah? so this, this this is the quote um you have to go three links down just to find the quote itself someone's always writing some janky article about it but anyway this is a quote from theodore roosevelt right that kind of personifies everything i'm speaking about here right um this is from goodreads um this is from the book what's the book from hmm from henry david is it oh, from walden i actually have walden here um so this says the following um henry david Faru quote from walden the mass of men leave lives of quiet desperation what is called resignation is confirmed desperation from the desperate city, you go into the desperate country and have to console yourself with the bravery of minks and muskets. A stereotyped but unconscious despair is concealed even under what are called the games and amusements of mankind. This is no, there is no play in them, but this comes after work. But it's a catalyst of wisdom to not do desperate things, right? And that's what it is. The mass of men live lives of quiet desperation, right? They're just there in their cubicles, sad about life, you know, bemoaning everything. And then when someone else tries to do something different, tries to be a bit out of the blue, out sorry, out of the box and try and, you know, break the mold and try and break the fourth wall. Oh, you should be wasting your time, wasting your time. Get out of here, man. Oh, yeah. Have you ever noticed that Henry David Farouk has a kind of like, or Davido has a kind of Henry David Farouk kind of beard, that kind of weird beard that kind of just, you know, don't have any facial at all. Just around, you know? Davido has that kind of beard. Yeah. Anyway, um, recommend you check it out. Henry David Farouk, one of my favorite authors. Um, Warden as well is an amazing book. I've read that a couple of times now. It's very small as well. Small book, probably about, 100 pages maybe less i uh, recommend you check it out very very cool book and again um the video is called i trained uh to become an mma fighter in four months um it's on buzzfeed i'll link in the show notes for you guys to check out it's a really cool video again that really kind of hit home with me and gave me a lot of inspiration for the things going forward Hello. What else do we have to talk about here? Balenciaga Full Winter 19 collection. How do you like that, right? Big fan of Balenciaga. As you know, I am a fan of Demna and everything that he does. Demna is God. God is Demna. Uh, fashion would be boring without Demna and his um, clone, basically, on the scene right now, right? That kind of big, boxy, um, um, central European, Eastern European look has got the fashion game going nuts. And yeah, um, and in an effort to kind of expound that version and kind of take it mainstream, he's decided to do this amazing, amazing, amazing ad campaign for Balenciaga where he recruited some real life Parisian couples to front this campaign. It looks fucking amazing to be fair. Again, Balenciaga worn by real people because if you only, we only see Balenciaga, that's a problem that Balenciaga had in the, in the, in the beginning, right? When everyone was kind of taking the piss out of the fact that he wasn't hiring any you know models that weren't white um and pale and skinny was that that was his crew right again i don't believe it for the most part i think you know there was a bit of you know miscommunication or there was a lack of foresight in that regard because it's an easy win just for a couple people on there that you know from different kind of walks of life and everyone's kind of happy for the most part and the kind of disparaging thing i think for me was that vetemar and Blanchard, especially when they first began the first show they had 
on the runway that everyone kind of was hyped about you know everyone from the scene was there jerry lorenzo kanye don c all these flipping people from you know the hype beast sort of like fashion world were there supporting the brand so it was evident from the beginning that it really resonated with the kind of urban crowd um of course it went fucking kaboom with asians right and chinese people and stuff and koreans loved it all the big korean kind of k-pop guys are wearing it so it just felt as if like the only people wearing your stuff are people that don't look like you right so why not have them in the one way that's that was a weird weird thing but again i do get the idea that he could just be you know you just might not have that many friends that aren't that don't look like him right which is understandable but so far they've tried to really kind of correct their wrongs they've got a couple of muses they use again and again and again um and so far again but there is a real difference in terms of how Balenciaga looks on the runway and how it looks in real life right and I think they've kind of noticed that and they're kind of making amends because I do think that Balenciaga worn by actual people in real life really makes you appreciate how much of a design shift in culture and the kind of wave frequency going on at the moment that Demna has applied to the scene and again I think like Hedy Hedy like Hedy Simane like Rick Owens um like in, maybe even Ralph Lauren uh maybe Heide Aikerman uh especially helmet lang these people are only really be appreciated phoebe philo these young people only really be appreciated once they're gone it's sad to say macabre to say but again fashion is so weird like that carl lagerfeld is only getting his flowers now really for the most part there's a lot of people disparaging his name saying that he was old he was tired he was good champion of chanel and now they're kind of you know celebrating just how much of a just how high of a level he was playing at at the time that carl lagerfeld was around right designing on so many different fronts so many different consist um over across you know such a crazy fucking schedule right everyone loves to pop their calendar like I'd, I'd, I'd hate to see what carl Lopez calendar look like right at the height of his fucking uh d- d- design prowess um so again basically looks so much better in real life in context but again you know because it's, it's in the moment and it's all trendy now and it's a bit you know it's kind of trendy to say how overpriced the hoodies are and complain about the whatever it is online that people aren't appreciative what it is but when you see it worn in public you're like oh, okay i get what he's done here because those are the same design codes the same kind of design sensibilities the silhouettes themselves the colors the textures whatever maybe have been iterated out throughout the entirety of fashion whether it's skateboarding whether it's streetwear whether it's high street fashion everyone's kind of taken a little bit of what he's doing and apply it to what they're doing um and again this is my only my opinion but Balenciaga worn in runway and worn in real life is completely different right so this is the latest collection from 2019 um which again is probably one of my favorite collections I've done again of recent times 109 looks like just absolutely wall-to-wall um garments upon garments upon garments right I'm gonna get up on the screen for you guys to see um so loads of amazing looks right that you you know you can always always be a fan of but again it's hard to kind of see yourself visually in it because you know all the models look fucking insane they're plucked from you know the depths of instagram and kind of put out on there they look fucking immaculate everyone looks fucking banging so it's hard to kind of see yourself in the clothes but the moment they you know so instance these kind of long trench coats look but the moment someone in real life wears it you're like ah you immediately know this trench coat is from balenciaga that long uh check uh hounds two for checkered uh trench coat you know immediately it's from Balenciaga, from the shoulders to the way it sits, to the button, to the length. It's, you know, it's undeniable. So they've taken that and applied it to this kind of ad campaign where they recruited some real-life Persian couples, um, loads of um, interesting couples, loads of great mixes. Um, and just, it's an amazing, um, again, uh, campaign, I think, overall. I really highly recommend some of you guys check it out. Again, especially if you're not, especially if you're not a Balenciaga fan, I think stuff like this will really make you appreciate just how an ama- just how much of an amazing job he's done uh, with his collection so far. You see so many great pieces the, the Paris look you see little details of how the Paris hoodie sits the cut on the pants the way the slippers look these boots the bag just like um, like see if you pass these couple uh, at like a high street somewhere right they're wearing a, an amazing jumper some nice trousers right you know immediately they're wearing something really expensive you know it looks so ordinary that's the power of Balenciaga but again the actual power of it is that people like myself who can't afford everything in a collection can go out and buy things that similarly fit that kind of mold, right? Whether I want to buy a uh, electric blue turtleneck or maybe some trousers that aren't maybe the same color as that lime green pant, but have maybe the same cut. And then I can sit those on top of some Chelsea boots that I buy from Dr. Martin's, right? There's lots of things that you can do by taking these sort of design codes, more so than you maybe could do from taking inspiration from an actual runway collection, which is kind of hard to kind of, you know, adapt into your day-to-day i think wardrobe personally i think for myself it's hard to kind of see yourself in this sort of clothes you can see some i see myself in pieces but not maybe in outfits i think for the most part it's hard to see yourself in it right um this model for blenjago is amazing right erwin Werder, this older dude he looks fucking so cool in blenjago um such a cool dude um but this kind of again ad campaign does a really good job of kind of putting you inside of the clothes 
Everything here looks stellar. Look at the shoes. That kind of O neck on the finger looks amazing as well. The bags, the boots, the all over print jacket. Look at the jacket. Look how good that jacket looks. Like it looks incredible. So amazing. This couple here, oh amazing. Look at the dress, the boots again. His outfit looks amazing. Just again, really can check it out. It's for the full 19 collection. You'll probably be able to see it's all over the high street or, or iterations of it copied by loads of other brands coming up forward or coming up in the next couple of weeks and stuff. So we can really check it out. Blenshaw got full winter. 19 collection worn strong by this horde of fashion influencers from Paris. Anyway, um, you know what? What's it been? It's been an hour and ten, man. Longest podcast I've done in a while. So I think this might should, should, this might be a good place to say goodbye. Um, yeah, you know what? Let's maybe say goodbye right there. That might be a good time to kind of end it and say my goodbye to all you lovely people. Or should I just con- maybe just continue? Let's do one more. Um, no, let's end it there. Actually, it's a good place to end it. I think too. Sometimes you know the less is better. Anyway, this is two two one Axel Zinger show. Thank you for tuning in as per usual. Um, I'm leaking as you can see. It's always really humid and sweaty here because I get really sweaty. That's the way I am. What can you do? What can you do? Uh, thanks so much again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have you guys here in in my company. Um, again, like I mentioned before, I'm going to try and upload as much as oft- as often as possible now going forward. I want to make sure that I'm committing to doing this podcast because I love it for my own enjoyment. I'm sure some of you people enjoy it as well. As per usual, if you want to support the podcast, there is a link down below to do that. Um, if you want to check out my mixes and DJ stuff, there's a link in my show description. Do to check that out. That's soundcloud.com uh, forward slash DJ Hanson Blackman or you know just search Hanson Blackman on, on SoundCloud you'll be able to find it. Or I'll put the link in my show description to find all my dates. So when I'm DJing, go on my website, actionzigger.com, click DJ at the top you can see where i'm playing it always i'm updating that really regularly um it's you can also support the podcast by you know liking the video subscribing if you haven't been here before um clicking on the comments and check, writing something back and asking a question and stuff i'll be able to get back to you in due course um you can leave a five-star review being a podcast app that does a good way of you know, making sure people see it because that's where people do uh, itunes kind of aggregates how to kind of pop things up on the charts whatever it may be so that's a good way to do it as well and as per usual, just keep checking out the show when you can, man. Whenever you get around to doing it, it's all good, baby, baby. Anyway, this has been the Action Thing Show episode number 221. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have the company of yourselves. I hope you have a great rest of the week. And I'll see you again, guys, tomorrow for an episode of the show. Take care. Bye.